Uh, John Hengevel, the Director of High Performance Computing Strategy. Uh, Welcome, thank you, John. Thank you, Radek. Uh, uh, my name is John Hengevel. I'm the Director of High Performance Computing Strategy at Intel. Uh, I uh, really appreciate you folks coming out this morning. Hope you're enjoying uh, IDF and finding it uh, useful. It certainly had a lot of uh, good news uh, showing up. I'm going to take it a little bit of a different direction for the next hour or so. We're going to have a couple of really uh, interesting gentlemen come up here and join me. We're going to talk about uh, the role of technical computing and high-performance computing uh, in moving forward the pace of discovery, uh, the pace of science, and the pace of innovation. Just to give you some context, uh, much of what you experience at IDF focuses on uh, <coughs> the, you know, the desktop, the la laptop, the personal experience of, uh, of computation. Uh, but in the, in the enterprise space, we also serve uh, three other areas. We, we serve the cloud service delivery elements. This is providing services to you know, a lot of those personal devices, the netbooks, the laptops, the smartphones, uh, a variety of different compute services that are offered in that space. Uh, the other thing we do is we do enterprise transactional computing. And the third aspect of what we do in the enterprise area is this thing called technical computing. And technical computing builds on ideas, and its computation is focusing on developing the new, developing new products, new experiences, new science, uh, because there's a tremendous ROI in doing that, return on investment in doing that. So uh, uh, technical computing has different optimization points. In a, low, in, a, in a laptop, for example, you're thinking about mobility and battery life. Well, we don't think about that in technical computing. Uh, we think about things like uh, how to be deliver the best performance in a certain area of space, or how to, how to interconnect lots of computation together. So the solution space for technical computing is a bit different from the solution space in the, in the, in the commercial sector, and I'll talk a, a fair amount about how those differences uh, matter. So the three topics I'm going to talk about today, uh, one is uh, accelerating the pace of discovery, the second is crossing the gap, how do we make the capability of technical computing available to more people uh, uh, more cost effectively and what are some of the issues in getting to that. And the third is we're going to take a look at uh, uh, forward in the future a little bit, what we call the horizon of insight uh, and how we're going to get to exascale and expand the impact of HPC. So um, to start with, if technical computing is about finding the new and working on the new, uh, there's never been uh, a time where uh, pressing the innovation in the new has been more uh, necessary on, on a global front and on so many issues. Uh, there are major issues in weather and climate. How can we uh, anticipate uh, how uh, humankind is impacting uh, climate patterns? Uh, how can we model and study uh, impact of policy, for example, uh, on, uh, on uh, uh, the, the ecosystem, the, the global ecosystem that we're a part of? Um, the need for new forms of energy as the population continues to expand. Uh, we're going to need new forms of energy to serve uh, the developing uh, technology and the developing uh, uh, capability needs for the population around the world. Uh, and healthcare, uh, as we look at uh, this population continuing to expand, how do we find a robust way to deliver uh, better life, better quality of life for people around the planet? Uh, and it turns out that technical computing is a, is a part of each of these levels. I'll show you how. Uh, in, uh, in weather and climate, climate uh, addressing global climate change, world population is expected to be about 9.22 billion uh, by 2075. That's a lot of people. And uh, uh, managing weather, climate, water, environment, uh, it's critical to making sure our planet can... I'm not worried about our planet. Our planet will survive just fine, thank you. Uh, I'm worried more about us. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the 9.75, 9.22 billion people, how, what kind of lives are they going to lead? And so, anticipating and predicting and putting in place appropriate policies uh, is critical to the management of our lives uh, and health in the context of this planet. So, a lot of scientific progress has been made premised on technical computing. Uh, multi day weather prediction uh, has been achieved, uh, ocean current simulations enable us to study. Uh, you know, currents uh, enable us to study uh, fisheries, uh, enable us to study uh, the distribution of energy and, uh, and biomass in the oceans are, are amongst the two of the major uh, moves forward in, uh, in, in studying global climate that are premised on technical computing. 
uh, as we look at how we want to fuel the world. Um, we want to know where, where are we going to find new oil reserves? Where are we going to find new uh, natural gas capabilities? Uh, how are we going to find uh, ways to deliver energy at reduced cost uh, so that we can handle this expansion of population globally? A lot of scientific progress has been made here too. Uh, finding new oil reserves and developing new techniques to access them. <coughs> Controversial, yes, some of them, but, uh, but, the, but the practical reality is that we found new reserves in places that we weren't looking before. Like right where we thought things were expired previously. One of my favorite things that I ran into last year was uh, at SEG, uh, was some people who discovered that if they just drilled deeper in some wells that were previously thought extinct, they could find new well reserves. Well, they, they did uh, some observational modeling of these things to find out where the right places to go. That's all part of the scientific progress that we've seen. Um, in addition, if we're going to continue to use uh, uh, fossil fuels, we better know what the impact of those fossil fuels are on the environment as we try to extract them. So things like understanding uh, water impacts uh, when you do uh, the deep fracture drill, uh, or understanding uh, oil diffusion in, uh, uh, say, you know, Gulf of Mexico leaks, for example, are areas where uh, computational science and technical computing have made a large difference in our ability to understand and manage those risks. Uh, and of course, breakthroughs in fusion, fusion research, we're a brand new uh, set of research science that's going on in Japan right now, uh, and uh, Intel will be a part of that uh, to try and uh, develop new forms of energy that will make a difference uh, to uh, life, life quality in the world. Um, third, uh, health. Um, health. Health science, and, and, and David will come here, up here and talk in a minute about this. Um, new ways of, to, to deliver health re requires understanding the science of health much better. Uh, and so the more we understand uh, the underlying chemical and physical properties of viruses, of, uh, of us as people, of uh, the elements of the ecosystem around us. Uh, and factoring genomes and doing gen genomic studies are a key part of that. Uh, the cost of doing a genome today is, is $30,000. What would happen if the cost would drop to 1000 So there's been a lot of discussion about this personalized medicine concept. Uh, scientific progress. So we, the, the technology to map the genomes uh, is making tremendous progress. And uh, in addition to that, full body medical imaging makes it possible to do better diagnosis today. Uh, than in the past by significant margins. Uh, to give us a little bit more in-depth impact on uh, computational science, on uh, health, health, life sciences work, genome work, uh, we brought up uh, a very uh, terrific speaker for us today. Uh, David Patterson, Director of Parallel Computing Laboratory uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, let's welcome him up. Thanks. This appears to work. All right. I'm uh, happy to be here. This has next 10 minutes to tell you a story. The story has some deadly fractions. It's got uh, trying to understand the difference between opportunity and obligations, and then maybe a new way to push the frontier of computing in the 21st century versus the, uh, the last century. Uh, I'm as part of the AMP Lab, a, a project that started six months ago at UC Berkeley, there's about 10 faculty involved on, on one of them. So uh, what this lab is tackling is what's commonly known in the press as big data problem. So big data is massive. Uh, Facebook gets 400 terabytes of pictures of data it has to process. Google does 25 petabytes of information uh, routinely. Uh, it's already big and it's growing. It's growing because there's a lot more devices, like John showed in his talk. There's a lot more people, particularly one of the, one, half of the people on this planet have a cell phone account. It's starting to the biggest growth area that's in, in the uh, third world. And, you know, the storage devices themselves are growing at incredibly cheap. It costs five cents to store it for the, the storage cost for a gigabyte. And this data itself is, uh, on everything, it's uh, it's there's no schemas. It's not curated. Uh, it's, it's many different formats. So the data itself is dirty, which makes it difficult. So our kind of definition that we're using in the AMP lab is this, this kind of trade-off between time and money. It's that 
the normal, we say you have a big data problem, it's not just that it's big, that if the normal use of technology won't let users uh, obtain timely and cost-effective answers of sufficient quality uh, to data-driven questions. And this challenge is why a lot of people are saving all this data in the belief that they'll figure out a way to make it valuable. Uh, the approach that we're taking in AMP Lab is we're going to advance machine learning algorithms. Uh, we have what um, we, my joke is the Michael Jordan of machine learning, his name is Michael Jordan, to help lead that effort. We want to produce advanced cloud computing and high performance computing uh, machines, you know, being able to use thousands of machines to work on this, and crowdsourcing the people, that's the AM and P part of it, and to try and extract uh, value from the big data and increase the cost of maintaining big data. Now, one of the challenges for academic researchers if you're going to work on big data is to find big data. Usually, uh, for academics, big data is either, or the data is either small and interesting, that's kind of hard to do a big data research project that fits on a thumb drive, right? Or it's big and boring. It, usually, if it's big and interesting, it's proprietary. So one of our challenges was to find something that was big and interesting that could drive a research agenda. And what we found out about was uh, this opportunity with uh, genomics and computing and personalized medicine. So there's an effort that's a, in the United States called the Cancer Gen Genome Atlas, TCGA. So what they're doing is for the top 20 most widespread cancers, they're taking 500 tumors of each of them and getting the genome plus a normal cell to compare that, and that's five petabytes. And our colleague, David Hassler at UC Santa Cruz, is making that available to our research project. So, which is great for us, is that we can get a lot of data that's both big and interesting. Uh, and now comes some of the, uh, so what can we do with that, as uh, John pointed out, this belief is this is going to help us for personalized medicine. This is from Time Magazine a couple of months ago, the leader of the TCGA saying, within a decade, we expect to have personalized medicine that, based on your genome, rather than giving average case diagnoses, what's specifically for you? That's the hope that they'll have in a decade. Now, here's the deadly fractions here. So, so just how prevalent is cancer? Uh, Wonderfully, there's a wonderfully written book on this topic that just came out this last year called The Emperor of All Maladies. It actually won the Pulitzer Prize for Nonfiction. It's written by a person who's both a medical doctor and a medical researcher and a wonderful writer <laughs> and who does a good job explaining biology and the history of the cancer. So here are these deadly fractions. A quarter of all the deaths in the United States uh, are from cancer. That's seven million people a year around the world. A third of women in the United States will get cancer sometime in their lifetime. Half of men in the United States will get cancer sometime in their lifetime. And so as the author says in the book, it's not a question of whether in these industrialized nations your family will be exposed to cancer, it's when. So that's a sobering thing. What is cancer? Cancer is this perversion of a normal cell. Our cells grow and replace themselves. Cancer has tries to be immortal, limitless growth. The, the growth thing, the breaks and the stop working on the cancer cells. Not only does it grow crazily, it changes itself as it grows to make it a harder target to try and wipe out. And then it does this terrible thing. It starts in one part of your body and then it spreads to the rest of your body. That's what doctors say, metastasizes. So it's this amazingly challenging disease. What we know now, and really we didn't know surprisingly, read this book, we didn't know that that's many years ago, over the last decade or so, that cancer is a genetic disease. It comes about when your body replicates cells, there's just accidental transcription errors that happen, like a, just an error rate, so this will happen. But also, if you expose yourself to carcinogens, then the error, the error rate is much faster, which leads, leads to, can lead to this cancer. So that's why it's happening, and part of the reason it's even a bigger problem in the first world is all these other diseases we've, we've got to conquer. So what would it take to get to personalized medicine, uh, the customized therapy? And uh, colleagues at UC San Francisco said there are these five steps, and I'll go over these steps. But we want to get all the, we have to get through all five steps if we can reach that vision of something therapy custom to you in case you get a terrible disease. 
Well, the first thing is this equipment that takes you know, the biological material and turns it into digital information. Um, four years ago, it cost a million dollars. Four years ago, it was a million dollars to sequence a genome. You know, two years ago, it was $10,000 and it's projected the next year to be $1,000. So the, the biological uh, sequencing machine, that part is falling much faster than Moore's Law, and this turning what was clearly a biology problem five years ago to a digital binary problem uh, probably by next year. So one of the concerns, and this is from a leading, uh, the leading journal, Nature Methods, is that if we don't innovate in data processing, great, we'll have taken down one piece of it, the biological piece, to $1,000, but the data processing can be many times that. So this is something we need to tackle. And that's the thing that we're working on with our colleagues at UC San Francisco, is trying to use high-performance computing cloud technology to be able to do this much more effectively than you would today. And a problem that our colleagues at San Francisco, it took more than a day to do on a PC, a multi-core PC, a modern processor they were able to do in less than an hour on the, in, in that, you know, that actually a uh, large scale high performance computing system. So that's promising that we can get these prices down. The last two steps in, are right in the middle of what the Ample app is doing, which is what we want once as we get these genomes of cancers there, which nobody knows about because we've never been able to have that information online. Let's make advances in machine learning algorithm, advances in data analytics to see what we find. Is, is leukemia, blood cancer, association with the, the cancers of the liver or the pancreas? Will the same medicines that work for one work for the other? Nobody knows the answer to that because that information hasn't been available, so we're excited about getting that opportunity. And we have to bring the price down, so we have to get much more efficient. And we're excited about doing new programming frameworks and new storage systems to bring that down. We, we think that's right in the center of our what we work on. Then the next step, is what about for each individual of these millions of patients, what's right for them? And we're interested in trying to use something like crowdsourcing to expand beyond what doctors can do, although this seems kind of crazy. We see this happening in other fields. There's a very popular system called Folded, which is trying to figure out how proteins fold themselves, and we can find people by playing games who are better than computers. Another example is that in astronomy called Galaxy Zoo, they had millions of galaxies classified. It would take them forever to do with computers. They got people to go out and do that for them. They did it in hundreds of months. So there's precedent that we can harness people to help us with really important problems facing society. Maybe they can even help with this. So this is that opportunity occupation. So I gave a talk at this UC Santa Barbara in May and talked about well, and then I woke up over in the middle of the night as I want to do and thought, wow, this means maybe it's computer scientists have as big as opportunities biologists to you know, advance the uh, fight against cancer. Wow, that's pretty compelling. And then I woke up the next day and I said, well, if it's plausible, maybe it's true, maybe it's not true, but if it's plausible that computer scientists could advance the fight against cancer that millions of people have, aren't we morally obliged to work on this if it's possible? Then finally, if, you know, you know Every family in the world is going to get cancer, and you could work on it. That's not compelling to you. There's probably a pretty big industry. Right? So we go from average case diagnosis to personalized medicine. Everybody's going to want their genome sequence, and so you know that's, there's a lot of people uh, and a lot of processing for everyone to be able to do that. Uh, and then finally, my last slide is kind of philosophical. Uh, you know, uh, how should we be pushing the frontier of computer science? It's, uh, is it just uh, Thomas Edison didn't give a damn if it, if, it, if it couldn't be a product, he didn't want to work on it. Bohr, who was a physicist, if, if he couldn't turn it into, uh, he was interested in pushing physics, not products. But Louis Pasteur was interested in doing both. He was trying to solve the problems of the day. He's one of the fathers. He also helped prove germ theory. He's one of the fathers of modern biology. But he, he came up with the first uh, vaccine for Rabies, the first infecting environment. So he, he solved the problems of the day and pushed the state of the art of biology, and maybe that's what we're going to be able to do, trying to attack and advance big data by helping a societal need. Thank you. Thank you.